name of this series is Answering Islamic Apologists. And so we, as Christians here, are going to try to answer Dr. Badawi. And I'm with our research, our director of research, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here. Thanks, Larry. And uh, I'll just put Dr. Badawi away. I'll put him back here where he'll be there for us for later. And then uh, we're going to pick up where we left off from the last program in this series. Badawi says you must have the right belief in God. Badawi is correct as far as saying you must have the right belief about the true and living God. Of course, the God of the Bible and the God of Islam are two completely different entities. The God of the Bible says you must believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. See 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 22, John chapter 2 verses 19 through 22, Luke 24 36 through 46. You must believe in the deity, that meaning being God, of Jesus Christ. See John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. John chapter 20, verse 28. Romans 9, 5. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Titus 2, 13. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Matthew 1, 23, etc. You must not deny the Trinity or any member of it, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. See Matthew 28, 19, Romans 15, 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Matthew 12, 31 through 32, Acts 5, verses 1 through 5, Hebrews 11, 6. You must not believe in any other gods. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 6, Jeremiah 25, verse 6, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, Deuteronomy 32, 16 through 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 19 through 22. You must not preach another gospel or religion. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Romans chapter 3, 21 through 26. Badawi's God, Jesus, and religion are not the same as the biblical God, the biblical Jesus, or the biblical gospel. Good deeds lead to salvation? Once again, the contrast between Badawi's Islamic God, Allah, and the biblical God could not be greater. Badawi's God is not the God of the Bible. Badawi's God perhaps will save a man from hell, if he does enough good works. However, the true and living God of the biblical record would deny this with a passion. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says, quote, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. End quote. Salvation comes only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not the good works of man. See Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, verses 11 through 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Badawi says Muslims are not obsessed with sin and atonement. Given the legitimizing of rape in Muslim lands, the violence even against fellow Muslims, it is safe to say that Badawi is right. Many Muslims are not too concerned with sin and atonement. Christians, however, are commanded by God to be concerned with sin and atonement for sin. The biblical record says that you must not deny repentance from sin. See Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Mark chapter 6, verse 12. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Badawi's tape number 16, Authority and Authenticity of Scriptures, 1 and 2. Point A, Badawi agrees that our Bible and his Quran cannot both be true. B, the Bible is supposedly full of contradictions and the Quran supposedly is not. C, Badawi says the Bible is man-made because it does not always say, quote, God said, end quote. D, Badawi trashes the New Testament and quotes from the Jehovah's Witness publication, awake to utilize additional attacks against Christianity. Point E, Badawi brings up copyist errors in the Bible 
and the genealogy of Jesus mentioned in both Luke and Matthew. The Bible and the Quran cannot both be true. Badawi is correct on this point. One of these must be false if the other is true. If the biblical record is true, validated by historical manuscript evidence, archaeology, prophetic utterances, and early church writings, then Islam is not only false, but is cursed of God, and likewise are its followers. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9 says, quote, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So say I now again, let him be accursed. That meaning damned to hell. Which the Bible or the Quran has real contradictions. All the alleged contradictions in the Bible we have heard are explained at www.biblequery.org. In contrast, Muslims cannot explain how Muhammad took a night journey to the mosque in Jerusalem, which was not built until after his death. Zul Karnaim discovered that the sun set in a muddy spring. Haman, who lived in Esther's time, did not travel back in time to Moses's etc. For more information on contradictions in the Quran, see the website www.muslimhope.com. Since the Bible does not always say, quote, God said, end quote, does that prove it is man-made? Badawi's shallow and superficial argument about, quote, God said, end quote, therefore makes the Bible man-made is refutable on its face. Badawi's own argument here could be just as easily used against the Quran. The Bible itself proves Badawi wrong. Genesis chapter 1 states that, quote, God said, end quote, nine times. Malachi says, quote, thus says the Lord, end quote, 23 times. Quote, the Lord spoke, end quote, appears 560 times in the first five books of the Bible alone. Isaiah claimed his message came directly from God 40 times. Ezekiel claimed this 60 times. Jeremiah claimed this 100 times. At least 3,800 times in the Old Testament, quote, the Lord spoke, end quote, appears. The New Testament writings carry the same authority of, quote, God said, end quote, throughout. See 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 15 through 16, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Luke 11, 28, Hebrews 4, 12, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, Matthew 4, 4, Matthew 22, 29, John chapter 8, verse 47, etc. Badawi quotes from the Jehovah's Witnesses Awake magazine. Badawi uses cultic, quote, Christian, end quote, sources such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, a group founded in the 1870s by a man named Charles Taz Russell, who believed ancient Egyptian pyramids foretold God's word. Badawi's tactic of using strange cultic groups to attack Christianity is no more valid than Christians using, for example, the Nation of Islam, black Muslims, who believe white men are devils created by a mad scientist to invalidate Sunni Islam and their, quote, white prophet, end quote, Muhammad. Bukhari Hadith, Volume 1, Number 63, Volume 2, Number 122, Volume 2, Number 141, Volume 1, Number 367, all show that Muhammad was a white man. Copyist Errors and Two Genealogies Jesus had not one, but two genealogies. His biological genealogy through Mary is in Luke, and his legal right through his stepfather, Joseph, is in Matthew. Badawi conveniently ignores the importance of the two genealogies of Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, 
and Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Badawi attempts to show a contradiction where none exists. Copious errors exist in both the Bible and the Quran, but those errors make up a very insignificant percentage of the overall texts and are known. The Quran, however, has missing and abrogated surahs according to Islamic authoritative hadith. To make a long story short, we're going to deal with the highlights of his arguments here from all these states, basically. Uh, and that is his accusation that the gospel records come from pagan origins, from, from myths and legends. The Islamic charge of pagan influence. These references are from Norman Geisler and Abdul Salib's outstanding book entitled Answering Islam, pages 306 to 309. Quote, the last charge that we would briefly address at this point is once again a rehash of outdated negative critical scholarship mixed with a misinformed and misleading Muslim version of church history. According to this charge, the Apostle Paul and some of the later church fathers corrupted much of the purity of Jesus' teachings by mixing the paganism of their day with the original message of Christ. For example, Yusuf Salim Kisti, in his book, What is Christianity? Being a critical examination of fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith, attributes such doctrines as the deity of Christ and the atonement to the pagan teachings of the Apostle Paul and the doctrine of the Trinity to the pagan formulations of church fathers. An honest reading of all the New Testament data will clearly demonstrate that Paul did not teach a new religion. Paul, similar to Jesus, taught that Christianity was a fulfillment of Judaism. See Romans 10, 4, 9 through 11, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Luke chapter 16, verses 16 through 17. In fact, all the allegations of Christian dependence on various mystery religions or Gnostic movements have been rejected by scholars in the fields of biblical and classical studies. Concerning the Quran, we would like to point out that based on the findings of reputable scholars of Islam, much of the content of the Quran can be traced to either Jewish or Christian works, often from Jewish or Christian apocrypha or pagan sources. Author Jeffrey, in his technical and scholarly volume entitled The Foreign Vocabulary of the Quran, ably proves that, quote, not only the greater part of the religious vocabulary, but also most of the cultural vocabulary of the Quran is of non-Arabic origin. Some of the vocabulary sources include Abyssinian, Persian, Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, and Coptic, end quote. It, it has been said by some non-Muslims that, uh, that, that Islam just came from a moon god. Okay, now this is sort of like a, a near miss because there are, uh, uh, there are Sabaeans who worshipped a moon god and they were just south of Mecca and, 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 and there were people who had a, uh, a god named you know, Al-Ilab but that's not necessarily tied as a moon god. And so you, uh, you cannot actually prove that, that Islam came from a moon god. And if you go back to like uh, in ancient Samaria, uh, where there, there was a moon god there, well, Samaria at the time of Abraham, let's see, that's 2000 BC, Muhammad six, uh, you know, 570 to 632 AD, that's a pretty big ga gap of years. So while I am saying that you do not say that Muhammad, you know, came from, you know, that Islam came from a moon god, it perhaps is just as accurate to say, or no more or less than accurate to say he came from a moon god, as it is to say that Christianity came from all these all all these crazy things. But I think both kind of just show, you know, how people um, try so hard to fit a particular religion into their particular box. That's right. That's right. So. Uh Basically, in a nutshell, especially with this book, is a great reference on the, the charge of pagan influence. There's good references in that book to uh, deal with uh, that subject in quite some uh, detail. So if our viewers, if you're interested in getting more on this, please get your hands on that book. But these charges that Dr. Bado and other Muslim apologists make 
if you take their very own arguments and try to and, and basically just turn them around on them, you know they're always marshaling on all their guns on the Christians and blasting away, but they never want you to take their arguments and their accusations and turn them around. And Steve kind of mentions some of this stuff, but turn around and, and, and start blasting at them. Well, let's take a look then in more detail about this whole argument and attack that the Muslims bring against Christianity about pagan influence, but let's turn it around on them. Let's take a look at uh, pagan influence on Islam and Muhammad and all this stuff and see, see how that looks. And also, if I might say, see how they like it <laughs> when, when their religion gets uh, brought under the hammer, yeah. like uh, like our, our religious faith is. Now, now, Larry, what time period are you talking about here? Uh, as far as uh, Muhammad, mm -hmm. that, he he did most of his revelations uh, in after 600 A.D. Okay, I think uh, particularly starting around 612 A.D. If my memory serves me correct, and he, and he about gave, 40, yeah, yeah, and he gave he gave surahs from what Doctor Badawi was saying on his tapes. Uh, at different times and different places, back at the Medina, uh, over a 23-year period. And the Quran later was put together in kind of a piecemeal fashion from the, the way uh, Muhammad had uh, given his, his, uh, his surahs. Yeah, but, but, the, th but the thing that, that, you know, we're not talking about something that happened, you know, um, 2,600 years later. We're talking about, well, what was Mecca like at the time Muhammad was born, at the time that he grew up? And... Just how similar was that to what Muhammad preached? Right, now that's what we're going to get into. This is from Ibn Warak in Why I'm Not a Muslim, page 39 and 40. Society in pre-Islamic Central Arabia was organized around the tribe, and each tribe had its principal deity, which was worshipped in a fixed sanctuary, even by the wandering nomads. The deity resided in a stone and was not necessarily in human form. Sometimes a sacred stone was a statue, or sometimes simply a big block of rock whose shape resembled a human. The heathen Arabs evidently imagined that the block of stone that served as a fetish was pervaded by a divine power and, in its turn, exercised a divine influence. The names of two hills, Asafra and Al Marwa, signify a stone that is an idol. Pagans ran between the two hills in order to touch and kiss Esau and Nela, the idols, placed there as a means of acquiring luck and good fortune. The Sacred Black Stone in Hubal We have evidence that black stones were worshipped in various parts of the Arab world. For example, Clement of Alexandria, writing CA 190, mentions that the Arabs worshipped stone, alluding to the black stone of Dusaris at Petra. Maximus Tyrius, writing in the 2nd century, says, The Arabs pay homage to I know not what god, which they represent by a quadrangular stone. He alludes to the Kaaba that contains the black stone. Its great antiquity is also attested by the fact that ancient Persians claimed that Mahabad and his successors left the black stone in the Kaaba along with other relics and images, and that the stone was an emblem of Saturn. In the vicinity of Mecca are various other sacred stones that were originally fetishes, but have acquired a superficially Mohammedan character by being brought into connection with certain holy persons. Uh, this is from Noldaki, Ancient Arabs, Volume 1, page 659. The black stone itself is evidently a meteorite and undoubtedly owns its reputation to the fact that it fell from the heavens. It is doubly ironic that Muslims venerate this piece of rock as that given to Ishmael by the angel Gabriel to build the Kaaba, as it is, to quote uh, Margolioth, of doubtful genuineness, since the black stone was removed by the Karmatians in the fourth Muslim century and restored by them after many years. It may be doubted whether the stone which they returned was, was the same as the stone which they removed. This is from Margolioth, Ideas and Ideals of Modern Islam, page 241. Hubal was worshipped at Mecca and his idol in red carnelian was erected inside the Kaaba, above the dry well, into which one threw votive offerings. It was very probable that Hubal had a human form. Hubal's position next to the black stone suggests there is some connection between the two. Uh, Velhausen thinks that Hubal originally was a black stone that, as we have already remarked, is more ancient than the idol. Velhausen also points out that God is called Lord of the Kaaba and Lord of the territory of Mecca in the Quran. The prophet railed against the homage rendered at the Kaaba to the goddesses Alat, Manat, and al Uzza, whom the pagan Arabs called the daughters of God, but Muhammad stopped short of attacking the cult of Hubal. From this, Velhausen concludes that Hubal is no other than Allah, the quote, unquote, God of the Meccans. When the Meccans defeated the prophet near Medina, their leader is to have shouted, Hurrah for Hubal! Circumambulation, that is, walking around, of a sanctuary is a very prominent rite practiced in many localities. 
The pilgrim during her circuit frequently kissed or caressed the idol. Sir William Muir thinks that the seven circuits of the Kaaba were probably emblematical of the revolutions of the planetary bodies. This is from Muir, The Life of Muhammad. While Zwemer goes on as to suggest that the seven circuits of the Kaaba, three times rapidly and four times slowly, were in imitation of the inner and outer planets. According to Zwemer, The Influences of Animism on Islam, page 158. It is unquestionable that the Arabs, at a comparatively late period, worshipped the sun and other heavenly bodies. According to Nolaki, Ancient Arabs, Volume 1, page 660. The constellation of the Pleiades, which was supposed to bestow rain, appears as a deity. There was a cult of the planet Venus, which was revered as the great goddess under the name of al Uzza. And, skipping a bit, the Muslim rites of running between Arafat and Musdalafa and Musdalafa and Mina had to be accomplished after sunset and before sunrise. This was a deliberate change introduced by Muhammad to suppress this association with the pagan solar rite. The worship of the moon is also attested to by the proper names of people such as Hilal, a crescent, Kamar, a moon, and so on. Uh, Hutzma, and this is uh, from Zwemer, page 160, has suggested that the stoning that took place in Mina was originally directed at the sun demon. This view has lent plausibility by the fact that the pagan pilgrimage originally coincided with the autumnal equinox. The sun demon is expelled, and his harsh rule comes to an end with the summer, which is followed by the worship at Muzdalifa of the thunder god who brings fertility. Muzdalifa was a place of fire worship. Muslim historians refer to this hill as a hill of the holy fire. The god Muzdalifa was Kuza, the thunder god. As Wensnick says, a fire was kindled on the sacred hill, also called Kuza. Here a halt was made, and this Wukuf has a still greater similarity to that on Sinai, as in both cases the thunder god is revealed in fire. It may further be presumed that the traditional custom of making as much noise as possible and of shouting was originally a sympathetic charm to call forth thunder. This is uh, from Zwemer, page 159. And all this was from uh, Ibn Warak again, Why I'm Not a Muslim, page 39 and 40. This is from Why I'm Not a Muslim by Ibn Warak, page 35. The works of Ignatz Golzaher and Kenry Corbin on the influence of Zoroastrianism on Islam. The words of Geiger, Tory, and Katz on the influence of Judaism. Richard Bell's pioneering work on the influence of Christianity. The works of Wellhausen, Nolaki, uh, Hergrangi, and Robertson Smith on the influence of Sabianism and pre-Islamic Arabia. And the work of Arthur Jeffrey on the foreign vocabulary in the Quran all combine to make us concur with Zwemer's conclusion that Islam is not an invention but a concoction. There is nothing novel about it except the genius of Muhammad in mixing old ingredients into a new panacea for human ills and forcing it down by means of the sword. And this is from Samuel Zwemer, uh, Islam, A Challenge to Faith, New York, 1908. For, as example in Surah 113, In the name of the merciful and compassionate God, say, I see refuge in the Lord of the daybreak from the evil of what he has created, and from the evil of the night when it comes on, and from the evil of the witches who blow upon knots, and from the evil of the envious when he envies. Islam owes many of its most superstitious details to old Arabian paganism, especially in the rites and rituals of the pilgrimage to Mecca. See Surahs 2, 153, 22, 28 to 30, and uh, 5, 1 through 4, and 22, 37. We can also find traces of paganism in the names of certain old deities in Surahs 53, 19, and 20, and 71, 22, and 23, and the superstitions connected with jinns, as genies, and the old folk tales such as those of Ad and Thamud. This is from Ibn Warak's Why I'm Not a Muslim, uh, page 36 and 37. The first five days, that is, the first five days of the Hajj pilgrimage. When the pilgrim first arrives at a point several miles outside Mecca, he prepares himself so that he is in a state of ritual purity or state of consecration. After donning simple pilgrim's dress and performing the necessary ablutions and prayers, the pilgrim enters the sacred precincts of Mecca, where he is expected to abstain from killing animals, tearing up plants, and indulging in violence, and taking part in sexual intercourse. He makes further ablutions and prayers at the sacred mosque of Mecca, al-Masjid al-Haram. Then he kisses the sacred black stone, which is set within the eastern corner of the Kaaba, the cube-like building in the center of the roofless courtyard of the sacred mosque. The pilgrim then turns to the right and circumambulates the Kaaba seven times, three times at a quick pace and four times at a slow pace. Each time he passes around the Kaaba, he touches the Yamani corner, where another auspicious stone is encased, and also kisses the sacred black stone. The pilgrim then proceeds to the Makim Ibrahim, or, place of Ab- or the place of Abraham, where Abraham is said to have prayed toward the Kaaba. He performs two further prayers and returns to the black stone and kisses it. Nearby is the sacred well of Zemzem. Usually, uh, usually it's spelled Zamzam, but here it was Zemzem. For according to Muslim tradition, Hagar and Ishmael 
drank in the wilderness. The pilgrims move on to an enclosure known as the al Hijr, where Muslims believe that Hagar and Ishmael are buried, where Muhammad himself is said to have slept on the night of his miraculous journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And then from Ibn Warak, why I'm not a Muslim, page 37, discussing the 6th through 10th day, he says, The pilgrim leaves the sacred mosque by one of its 24 gates. Outside, he climbs a gentle hill known as Mount Asafa, while all the while reciting verses from the Quran. He then runs from the top of Asafa to the summit of Al Marwa seven times, repeating various prayers. This ritual commemorates Hagar's putative search for water in the wilderness. This is the sixth day of the pilgrimage. The evening is spent at Mecca, where he goes around the Kaaba once more. On the seventh day, he listens to an oration in the great mosque, and then on the eighth, he proceeds to Mina, where he performs the usual services of the Muslim ritual and remains the night. On the ninth day, after morning prayers, the pilgrim proceeds to Mount Arafat, where the rite of standing, or wukuf in Arabic, is performed. According to Muslim tradition, Adam and Eve met here after their fall from paradise. Here the pilgrim recites the usual prayers and listens to another oration on the theme of repentance. He then hurries, the Arabic word means stampede, to Musalifa, a place between Mina and Arafat, where he is required to arrive for the sunset prayer. The next day, the tenth, is a day of sacrifice, celebrated throughout the Muslim world as Eid il Azza. Earlier in the morning at Musalifa, the worshippers say their prayers and move on to the three pillars in Mina. The, the pilgrim casts seven stones at each of these pillars, their ceremony being called Ramu ar Raja. And I apologize to Arab speakers for my probable mispronunciation. But anyway, it's the casting of stones. Holding the pebble between the thumb and forefinger with the right hand, the pilgrim throws it at a distance of not less than 15 feet and says, In the name of God, the Almighty, I do this, and in hatred of the devil and his shame. The remaining pebbles are thrown the same way. He then returns and performs the sacrifice of a goat or lamb. After the feast, the pilgrims celebrate the rite of deconsecration, when many pilgrims shave their head or simply have a few locks clipped. Muslims rationalize this particular superstition as symbolizing Abraham's repudiation of the devil, who tried to keep the great patriarch from his divinely commanded duty of sacrificing his greatly cherished son Ishmael. The sacrifice of a lamb or goat simply commemorates the divine substitution of a ram for Abraham's sacrifice. Based on what the viewer just heard, the pagan origins of the Hajj pilgrimage are obvious. Over a ten-day period, one, visit and kiss a sacred black stone. Two, touch the Yamani corner where another stone is encased. Three, return and kiss the black stone again. Four, climb a stony hill known as Mount as Safa to the rocky summit of Al Marwa. 5. Return to the stone Kaaba again to pace around it where the sacred stone is. 6. On the ninth day, Muslims climb the stony and rocky Mount Arafat to do rituals. 7. The tenth day, quote, the day of sacrifice, end quote, Muslims go to the three stone pillars in Mina and pick up 21 stones to throw at the stone pillars. Seven stones for each pillar. The viewer should notice the emphasis on stones and rocks in Muslim rituals. Worshipping a dead religion. Quote, stone dead. End quote. One, the lie of the landscape is dry and barren where the Hajj pilgrimage takes place. Two, the sacred Kaaba is made of stone. Three, kissing a, quote, sacred, end quote, black stone. Four, throwing stones at the devil. Five, in Jerusalem, the Muslim shrine, the rock of the dome, is venerated. Six, in Medina, Muslims visit the tomb of Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, Muhammad's tomb, Muhammad's uncle's tomb, as well as other graves. 7. Muslims are constantly venerating dead and lifeless objects such as stones and tombs. This symbolically betrays the lifeless character of this religion. Islam is a lifeless and dead religion when it comes to a true and living relationship with the living God of the universe. 
8. The Hajj pilgrimage of Islam reflects the barren Saudi Arabian desert that Muhammad grew up in and around. 9. The Muslim rituals at the Hajj pilgrimage betray its pagan origins and total alienation from the living God of the Bible. 10. By contrast to the barren and stony Muslim rituals, Jesus said, quote, But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. End quote. That coming from John chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus told pagan worshipers, quote, You worship what you do not know. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth, end quote. That coming from John chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Islam, by its Hajj pilgrimage and other paganistic rituals, such as kissing a black stone, etc., is violating Moses' command from God in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, quote, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God says here in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, that those who do such things, like the Muslims do at the Kaaba at Mecca, do not actually love the true and living God, but rather hate Him, and will receive the penalty for their error from God personally. The Islamic God, Allah, is not the God of Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, but is rather an idol created by pagan idolaters such as Muhammad. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37 through 38, quote, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, not a black stone, and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him, not the deadness of a rock, black stone, or tomb. What a contrast Jesus is to the dead religion of Muhammad. The scripture says to believe in the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. References there are Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, Revelation 19, 16, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. And his word, which has been preserved since long before Muhammad's stone veneration religion from the desert sands of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, was ever concocted. God's prophet Isaiah mocked dead graven image religion. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 44 verses 14 through 20. He heweth him down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash and the rain doth nourish it. Verse 15. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof, and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. Verse 16. He burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and said, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. Verse 17, And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. Verse 18, they have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. 
Verse 19, And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? Verse 20. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? See also 1 Kings 18.27, where God's prophet Elijah mocked the false prophets of Baal at the Mount Carmel. Is it mean and nasty to tell sincere religious believers the truth about themselves? Number one, is it loving not to tell someone the truth about themselves or their religious beliefs? Number two, was Jesus loving or mean and nasty when he said, quote, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 15, verse 33. 3. Was Jesus mean and nasty when he, quote, made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, the whip obviously taking time to make, and he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables, end quote, while shouting, quote, Get these out of here. John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. Number four, was Jesus wrong when he said, quote, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Point five, was Jesus without love when he said, quote, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. 6. Was the Apostle Paul unloving when he said of sincerely religious people, quote, Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They destroy the faith of some. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. Point seven. Again, is the Apostle Paul mean and nasty when he warns of false religion in the following example? Quote, For if someone preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus that we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4, 13 through 15. Point 8. The beloved apostle John said, quote, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, 1 John 4, 7-10. through 10. John is known as the apostle of love, and he said, quote, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, verse 1. Point 9. The Apostle John also said, quote, Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. 
Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. 2 John verse 9 through 11. Was the loving John being mean and nasty here? Point 10. The Apostle Paul said, Speaking the truth in love, from Ephesians 4.15. But what does this mean? Is it loving to not tell the truth because it may offend someone? Or is it loving to tell the truth in spite of the consequences in order that someone's soul might be saved? The answer to this question can be found in Paul's declaration. Quote, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Galatians chapter 4. Verse 16. Point 11. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. The Jews repeatedly tried to kill Jesus because of what he said throughout the gospel records. Paul, Peter, James, and other apostles were killed for what they taught. Many of the Old Testament prophets of God were killed or persecuted. Men of God throughout time have paid the price for telling God's truth. Jesus, the apostles, and the Old Testament prophets were not mean and nasty people, but were showing their true love for God and man by telling men the truth about God, in spite of men's sincere religious convictions to the contrary. Unfortunately, most men do not appreciate this truth, but prefer the example that Isaiah spoke of, quote, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. End quote. Isaiah 30, 9 through 11. Telling the truth. Throughout the Bible, specific warnings concerning false prophets and teachers are everywhere to be found. In fact, almost half of the Bible itself is apologetic in nature. That is to say, a defense of basic Christian beliefs against attacks and heresies. For instance, Colossians and the first epistle of John deal largely with refuting the Gnostic heresies of the first century. The message is clear. Christians are to, quote, contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints, Jude 3. Hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he, Christians, can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it, Titus 1, 9. Defending and confirming the gospel, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. End quote. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. There are five essential pillars of Islam. 1. The Creed. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. 2. Prayer. Five times a day. 3. Almsgiving. One fortieth of income goes to destitute. 4. Fasting. Ramadan. No food, drink, sex, etc. 5. Hajj pilgrimage. At least one visit to the Kaaba in Mecca during a lifetime. The Bible knows nothing of these Muslim work salvation rituals in order to achieve eternal life with God in the hereafter. All right, with that, I've got some concluding remarks as our time flies here. Uh, I've got pages of concluding remarks, but we'll just see how far I can get before our time runs out. Concluding Thoughts and Remarks Dr. Badawi and other Muslim apologists constantly commit logical fallacies in their arguments, such as argumentum ad hominem, which is the logical fallacy of destroying the argument by attacking the man rather than the argument. Argumentum ad populum, which is an argument to the people, appeal to the multitude, such as everyone knows, or all the scholars say, so forth, as Badawi so readily does. Argumentum ad vericundium, which is appeal to authority. Badawi constantly cites, quote, scholars say, end quote, quote, all scholars, end quote, etc., 
Badawi constantly fails to cite opposing scholars to his point of view. Badawi cites very few specific names throughout his tape series, but loves to say, quote, scholars say, end quote. Post hoc ergo proctor hoc. This means, quote, after this, therefore because of this, end quote. If something takes place in time before something else takes place, it must be the cause of what comes after it. Badawi commits this error again and again in his tapes, where he cites stories and legends in Greek mythology and other traditions and says that it is where the New Testament writers got their ideas about the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Card stacking, hasty generalizations, etc. Selective citation of Note saying all scholars, but then leaves out other scholars who would disagree with him. Hasty generalizations, giving some facts, but not all the facts, etc. Two, Dr. Badawi and other Muslim apologists ignore established historical records and their denials of the crucifixion of Christ. Pagan sources as to the crucifixion of Christ. A, Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus, 55 to 120 A.D., writing in his the Annals. B. Thallus, circa 52 AD, from his third book of histories. C. Lucian the Greek, the death of Peregrine, second century. Suetonius, AD 117 to 138. Pliny the Younger, AD 112. Celsius, AD 140. Mara Bar Serapion, between second and third century AD. Jewish sources. Josephus, A.D. 37 through 97, from his Antiquities, circa 90 through 95 A.D. The Talmud, under the Haggadah in Tractate Sanhedrin. B. The Talmud, under the Haggadah in Tractate Sanhedrin. Toledoth Jesu, A.D. 500. Yohanan ben Zakkai, disciple of famous Rabbi Hillel, in his book, Biography of Jesus the Nazarene, circa early centuries A.D. Gnostic Documents, The Gospel of Truth, A.D. 135 to 160. The Apocryphon of John, A.D. 120 to 130. The Gospel of Thomas, A.D. 140 to 200. The Secret Book of James, Early Centuries, A.D. Christian Documents Clement of Rome, A.D. 30-100 to 100. Ignatius, A.D. 35-107 to 107. Papias, A.D. 60-130 to 130. Polycarp, A.D. 65-155 to 155. The Didache, Early Church, A.D. Shepherd of Hermas, Early Church, A.D. Apologies of Justin Martyr, Early Church, A.D. Eusebius quoting Quadratus, Apology, 2nd century A.D. For further research, see History of the Christian Church by Philip Schaff, Erdman's Publishing Company, 1910. Muslim apologists ignore historical accuracy of the Old and New Testament scriptures, manuscript reliability, archaeological evidence, prophecy, 2,000 fulfilled Bible prophecies, scripture testimony to itself being the very word of God. 4. Muslim apologists are forced to attack the Bible and the writers of the Bible because of the vast difference between the way of salvation presented in the Quran to that of the Bible. Muslim apologists recognize that the God of Islam is not the same as the God of the Bible. Muslim apologists make the mistake of automatically assuming that their religion is true despite any credible evidence to the contrary. This error leads to the myopic position best known by, quote, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is already made up, end quote. Five, Muslim apologists pick and choose what they want to believe out of the Bible. However, these same apologists would argue that someone who did the same thing with the Quran cannot be a true Muslim and their theology of no value. This is known as the art of the double standard. Islamic reasoning, because of this, must answer these questions. If the Bible is corrupt, why believe any of it at all? How do you know which verse in the Bible is satanic 
and which verse is not. If Muhammad can believe and teach satanic verses and later have these verses abrogated, how do Muslims know if whole surahs or verses in their Quran should have been abrogated but were not? Worse yet, as the Hadith mentioned, what about key teachings by Muhammad that were not included in the Quran and apparently were left out? If Islam is true, then why give credit to corrupted and false religions such as Christianity or Judaism and call them brothers? If the Bible is false, then religions using the Bible must necessarily be false. If the Bible is true, then differing religions must necessarily be false. How can Islam verify itself by using religions which they claim are false? The fallacious arguments used by Muslim apologists for the veracity of the Quran and the inferiority of the Bible is itself a testimony of the truthfulness of the Bible and the dishonesty of the Quranic position. The majority of Badawi's arguments, for example, concerning the Quran being of God could likewise be used to prove the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, the Rig Veda, or the Upanishads of Hinduism, the Talmud of Judaism, science and health with key to the scriptures of Christian science, and other religious books. 7. The superiority of Jesus in both miracles, sinlessness, and personal purity is so overwhelming to that of the life of Muhammad that Muslim apologists have to subtly attack the character of Jesus in order to bring him down to the level of Muhammad. For example, A. Muhammad doubted his own salvation. According to Sahith al-Bakari Hadith 5.266, quote, How do you know that Allah has honored him? I replied, I do not know. May my father and my mother be sacrificed for you, O Allah's apostle. But who else is worthy of it, if not Uthman? He said, As to him, by Allah, death has overtaken him, and I hope the best for him. By Allah... Though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. Why follow a person who claims to be the greatest prophet, but does not know his own eternal destiny? On the other hand, the Christian is following the one, Jesus, who created the heavens and the earth, and has both the authority and a basis for forgiving sins. Jesus told his disciples many times of his departure and return to heaven. John 16, 5, John 17, 5. He gave others the right to go with him if they believed in him as Savior and Lord. 1 John 3, 2, 1 John 5, 13. Jesus reassured the thief on the cross, quote, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, end quote. Luke 23, 43. The previous two charts are quoted from Emir and Ergen Kanner, former Muslims, now Christian theologians, from their outstanding book entitled More Than a Prophet, page 125, Kriegel Publications, Grand Rapids, Michigan, year 2003. See also Unveiling Islam by the Kanners, Kriegel, 2002. Muhammad was a sinner while Jesus was not. The Quran clearly shows Muhammad to be a sinner. See Surah 48, 1 and 2, Surah 40, verse 55. The Islamic Hadiths clearly show Muhammad to be a sinner. See Bukhari, volume 1, 19, volume 1, 711, volume 1, 781, volume 8, 319, volume 8, 407, etc. For far more detail concerning this, see our show number 2 in this video series entitled Answering Islamic Apologists. The Quran and the Hadith, however, clearly show Jesus to be blameless, pure, holy, and faultless. See Surah 1919, Sahith al-Bakari, Volume 4, 506, Volume 4, 641, etc. Why should people follow a sinner rather than a holy and faultless prophet, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Revelation 1916, referring to Jesus Christ? 8. Muslim apologists are, as the Bible describes, Antichrist, 1 John 2.18, and their religion of Islam is a master Antichrist religion, 1 John 2, verses 22 through 26. 
Islam denies virtually all of the major tenets of the Christian faith. The very nature of God is denied, that God is revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. They deny that Jesus is God in human flesh. John 1, 1 and verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Romans 9, 5. Titus 2, 13, etc. They deny the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, verses 10 through 58. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 46. They de deny the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. They deny the sayings of Jesus and Moses. John chapter 5, verses 39 through 47. The Muslims believe in a different God. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. Jeremiah 25, 6. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 22. And they believe in a different religious message brought to them by what they believe to be the angel Gabriel. Thus they are condemned by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, another gospel by an angel, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9 declares, quote, When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. End quote. This is the fate of all who hold Islam. Muslims need the real Jesus as found in the Bible, not a false Jesus concocted by Muhammad. Acts chapter 16 verses 30 through 31 says, quote, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. End quote. You need to realize that, that, that there is a God of truth out there, and He is true and just, and that He loves you. You need to realize that all people have fallen and have fallen short, and no one can get to heaven on their own because we're, we're, all, we're all sinners. And even though it would be impossible for us to go to heaven on our own, God made a way. And that way isn't a philosophy or teaching. That way is a living way through Jesus Christ. And through his shed blood, uh, dying on the cross for us and rising from the dead, he made a way. But you need to make a decision. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and, and, and live your life for him and follow God and do what God wants you to do. And it, true faith it, it is not a religion, not even Christianity. It's following Jesus and following uh, God's word in the Bible. Amen. All right, uh, we've got to go. Our time's up. I'm uh, Larry Wessels with uh, Steve Morrison for Christian Answers, but I would like to say as we leave, uh, we have a free newsletter available to anyone that wants to call or write. Our phone number and address is at the end of the program. We have a website. We have two websites you, and an email address. You can contact that. You can get our newsletter for, for free. We don't uh, do this for money by any means. We have free literature, tracks, information on Islam, for instance. Here's just one of them. Uh, and any kinds of religion, actually, we have lots of information on all kinds of to topics. We want to thank you for joining with us today in this program. We don't hate the Muslims. We love the Muslims, and we yes. want them to know the truth. And that's why we do this, because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. We want the Muslims to know this Jesus so they will know the truth, and that's set out of love. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Be with us again next time.